afternoon. I'm Mary McGowan, Executive Director of the Myositis Association. I want to thank you for joining this afternoon's webinar on myositis and mobility equipment. We have an outstanding response to today's webinar. This is the first in an important series of webinars we are planning to address the mobility needs of those living with myositis. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions when registering. Your questions will be addressed during the Q&A at the end of today's presentation. We are honored to be introducing a wonderful speaker for today's educational event who will speak directly to your request for more information on this topic. Just a quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. Phones will be muted throughout the presentation. However, we encourage you to ask questions. There is a chat box located at the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions into this box at any time throughout the presentation. We will have a question and answer period after the speaker has completed her presentation. This webinar will be recorded and will live on TMA's website for future reference. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to give you a quick update on some important work TMA has recently accomplished. We had a very successful rare disease week. Thank you to all of the advocates who joined us in Washington, D.C., and all the advocates who participated by streaming events from home. I was honored to have the opportunity to make a public statement to the FDA about the needs of our myositis community at the FDA Rare Disease Day. TMA also attended a congressional briefing, and one of our members spoke on how environmental factors impact rare diseases like myositis. We were incredibly proud of our patient advocates who met with and spoke to their congressional representatives. Finally, our TMA advocates had the unique opportunity to have a luncheon meeting with our NIH researchers during Rare Disease Day at NIH and had a tour of the NIH Myositis Clinical Center. March 5th was a milestone day for inclusion body myositis. TMA held a patient listening session with the FDA on IBM. This was an extraordinary opportunity to share patient and care partner stories with approximately 25 FDA representatives and to begin to move the needle forward in our quest for drug development, treatments, and cures. We will be releasing a report with more detailed information about this patient listening session in the very near future. On May 8th, TMA will be hosting its inaugural Global Myositis Virtual Summit. Attendees will be able to attend from their computers and hear eight presentations from global myositis speakers, visit a vir virtual exhibit hall, participate in virtual chat rooms, and participate in numerous other virtual activities. For more information, please visit our website. This is an event not to be missed. And finally, we are very excited about our upcoming annual patient conference taking place September 10 through 13 in Bellevue, Washington. This year's theme is New Decade, Imagine the Future. We will have many exciting presentations discussing what is on the horizon for managing myositis, living well with myositis, and myositis research. Again, please visit our website for more information. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Ginger Walls. Ginger has 30 years of experience as a physical therapist in the area of neuro rehab and wheelchair seating mobility. She directed the outpatient therapy clinics and the seating mobility program at MedStar National Rehabilitation Hospital in Washington, DC. Additionally, Ginger has provided a variety of continuing education courses and lectures in the area of seating and mobility for many years. She has presented at major industry conferences, including RESNA, the Rehabilitation Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America, and the Paralyzed Veterans of America Summit. Ginger took on the role of Clinical Education Specialist for Promobile in 2015. Ginger, thank you so much for being with us today, and I'll turn the webinar over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. I'm excited to be here and to be able to talk with you a little bit about um, mobility options for, um, for people with myositis. And uh, I think there's a lot of new technology that it's great to learn more about. 
So um, Tricia, if you could advance the slide, we'll get started with the presentation. Uh, the idea is to um, match the right device with the, the user's needs. And so let's get into the um, topic and, and we'll go about uh, discussing the process. Um, by way of objectives, the things I'm gonna try to cover today are just understanding the process of how to get uh, or choose a wheeled mobility device or any assistive device, uh, help you understand the differences uh, among wheelchairs that are available out there and why ultralight wheelchairs um, have additional features that may be helpful to you compared to other wheelchairs. Also uh, try to talk a little bit about power assist devices uh, and the unique ways that they can benefit you. And then also talk about um, the differences among different powered chairs out there and seating features that are on powered chairs that might help you uh, choose, uh, work with your therapist and provider to choose the best power chair for you. So um, next slide, Tricia. So the steps to acquiring uh, any mobility device, whether it's an ambulatory device or a wheeled mobility device include first speaking with your physician about it and your clinical provider, a PT or OT usually, um, to get a referral for an evaluation for the best device for you. Um, and so the PT or OT would typically do the clinical and functional evaluation to understand what your needs are better and then uh, that helps them match the equipment to uh, your needs. And, and ultimately you work together to select uh, the appropriate product. Um, sometimes the clinician, um, oftentimes the clinician needs to do documentation and what's called a letter of medical necessity to explain why you need the device that you need. And then uh, it should always follow after you, the device comes in um, that you should come back to the clinic to get some uh, instruction on how to use the device and how to care for the device safely uh, and make sure that you're comfortable with that going forward. Uh, and then any follow-up, if your needs change, uh, you should be able to follow up with that clinician or provider to help the device be adjusted to meet your needs ongoing. So next slide. Um, so the things that the clinician would cover in your evaluation include your medical history and prognosis, understand your social and environmental situation, your functional needs, where you're gonna be using the device, what you need it to do for you, um, understand your physical limitations uh, and capabilities and needs, and then match those needs uh, to the appropriate type of mobility device, um, making sure, again, that its features and parameters line up with your needs. And uh, you should look at different manufacturers and models that are available to make sure you get that good match. Uh, the, there is a, another person in the player, in, player on the team, and that's the equipment provider. So typically you're not getting the device directly from the clinic, uh, unless it's a simple cane uh, or something like that. But typically uh, there's an equipment provider uh, someone that's in the business of providing wheelchairs, um, especially complex rehab technology wheelchairs. Uh, and so that provider uh, is, is really important uh, to the success and outcomes of this uh, in addition to the clinician. So kind of the algorithm that the therapist is working through in, in his or her mind is, can the person that I'm trying to help in clinic functionally walk with a cane? And if they can't use a cane, a single point cane, can they use a quad cane or hemi walker or crutches? And if they can't use that, can they use a, a walker? Um, and if they, once they find that appropriate ambulatory device, then that's how the clinician would move forward. But if you can't use an ambulatory device, um, then they would start down the path of looking at a wheeled mobility device. And then there's also the category of cannot functionally ambulate using an ambulatory device. And if that's the case, then uh, you would also progress and move towards um, getting a wheeled mobility device. Um, next slide. So what does non-functional ambulator mean? 
it means you can ambulate a little bit, but there may be some limitations related to safety or related to energy conservation or fatigue or just related to, yeah, I can walk across the house, but it takes me forever. And, you know, if you need, if you're going to the bathroom and you need to, to get there in two minutes and it took you seven, then that's not functional. Um, falls is another big indicator of non-functional ambulator. Yes, I can walk, but I'm falling, you know, once a week, once a month, twice a day, whatever it is, it's too much. Uh, and so that would be an indication that, yeah, you're capable of taking some steps, but it's really not safe. Um, or maybe you're taking some steps, but by the afternoon, you're so tired that at the end of the day, you really sh would have been better served with a different device so that maybe you didn't get that tired. Um, next slide. So to rule out functional ambulation, the clinician is going to take some objective measures. They're certainly going to look at, at your strength and range of motion. Um, but they're also going to ask you if you have pain. They're going to ask you if the pain increases uh, with, um, with activity. Uh, you know, it's the doctor, it hurts when I do that. So, well, don't do that, right? Um, it's, they're going to be looking at the distance that you travel, um, how much exertion or effort that that takes you. Uh, and they may look at cardiopulmonary effects, whether that exertion or effort decreases your O2 saturation or affects your other vital signs, or just if it gives you, uh, if it takes you a while to recover from a, a basic exertion, because your functional ambulation that you do throughout the day should not be something that exhausts you. Uh, you should be, it shouldn't be the equivalent of exercise. In other words, exercise by nature is fatiguing, but functional activities should not be uh, fatiguing to that level. Next slide. So, um, so the first step as as I've established is is to rule out ambulation. So if we've ruled out ambulation, then then what's next? Next slide. Um, it's time to consider wheeled mobility. And so, again, the physical or occupational therapist is going to need information about your physical capabilities, what are your strength or range of motion limitations with their, your arms and legs, how much postural support do you need, what are your other physical impairments that are of concern, how long do you think um, you'll be in the wheelchair each day. That's an important consideration, not only clinically, but also from a payer standpoint. The insurance company is, is going to want to see in the documentation um, if, if uh, complex rehab technology de uh, wheeled mobility device is being recommended for you that it is your you know primary recommended device for mobility throughout the day. Um, we should also be considering how you'll complete your activities of daily living, ADLs or IADLs, instrumental activities of daily living that, that includes activities in the community, um, with the, the chair as well. And also the therapist will be considering where you're going to be using the chair in, your, in the home, in the community, on different types of transportation, at work, at school, etc. cetera. Uh, next slide. So let me take a minute to explain the difference between DME, durable medical equipment, and CRT, complex rehab technology. Um, DME is basic stuff. This is the, the type of equipment that you see in the airport uh, being used, you know, um, so or the grocery store. So DME must be able to withstand repeated use, um, isn't necessarily useful to someone who isn't sick and, and isn't always used um, in the community. Sometimes it's just for in-home use. Uh, Medicare requires uh, a physician order for durable medical equipment, but it's something you can take that prescription to a supplier and pick out your cane or walker. You don't have to have a clinical evaluation with a PT or OT, um, but it's, it's a good idea uh, to get one because um, there may be other things um, 
to consider and certainly some device training that could be useful to you, uh, similar with looking at how will this device be used within the home. Next slide. So uh, DME manual uh, power chairs and POV. A POV is another name for a scooter. POV stands for power operated vehicle. Um, so uh, any level of basic um, mobility equipment like this is, is intended for part-time mobility. It's not intended for someone who needs uh, a chair um, or wheeled mobility assistance all the time. Um, and the reason for that is that general, there's, generally there's very standard seat sizes uh, that this equipment comes in. It doesn't have significant amounts of postural support. Uh, it's, it's for someone who has good sitting balance and doesn't have a lot of pain or doesn't have a progressive condition. And it's just gonna be sitting there for a short period of time. Um, this, uh, it's important to note that just the data that we know from the research uh, about uh, scooters in particular, that there are more falls from scooters than from power wheelchairs, significantly more. Uh, and so that's, if, if you're already having fall concerns, considering a scooter may not be the best um, device to, uh, to consider. Next slide. So uh, just by differentiation, complex rehab technology or CRT um, is very different from standard off the shelf DME. Uh, complex rehab technology uh, includes individually configured manual and power wheelchairs, uh, seating systems that are designed to help give um, better positioning, posture alignment, and even skin and tissue protection. And this type of equipment requires evaluation, measurements, fitting, um, configuration, adjustments, programming, and even training on how to use well. Um, and because this equipment is designed to meet the individual's um, unique medical, physical, and functional needs um, with diagnoses um, that uh, are more typically complex that are um, than, than just basic uh, DME, which is intended for temporary use. So, so CRT uh, includes uh, a broad range of services compared uh, to DME. And, and so the providers that are providing uh, CRT type equipment uh, will have additional training and certification than just uh, the pharmacy that's providing DME. Um, so, um, the CRT, since it requires specialized training, you can expect that CRT pr provider to be there for you to help with ongoing adjustment of the equipment or programming of it. Um, and, uh, and again, you're gonna get better outcomes overall with that um, when that's the right equipment for you. Next slide. So uh, CRT wheelchairs are designed for someone who the wheelchair is their primary means of mobility every day, who uh, is sitting in the wheelchair for a long period of time, who has limitations in balance. Um, maybe it's someone who needs power seat functions, power tilt, power seat elevation, power recline, uh, et cetera. Um, CRT wheelchairs can have more specialized seating put on, them and so they provide greater postural support um, and mitigation of pain um, in particular because CRT wheelchairs can have suspension. They will not jar your preserves as much when you're riding along the street in them um, and, uh, and also be able to navigate on different types of terrain better because of that. Um, so uh, if you have a progressive condition the programming and adjustability um, is, uh, is such that they can be uh, modified to change with you. So as your needs change, um, they're more easily um, modified uh, to meet your needs. They're very modular and programmable, whereas with the basic DME, it's kind of what you see is what you get. Uh, I just saw a question pop up about a weight restriction yes these wheelchairs are all typically 
uh, rated for a particular weight capacity. Um, basic adult chairs go up to 300 pounds for a power wheelchair and between 250 and 270 pounds um, for an ultra lightweight manual wheelchair. And then there are heavy duty models available beyond that. Next slide. So with manual wheelchairs, um, just to give you a visual of the spectrum, um, the ultra lightweight wheelchair or the Medicare code K0005 is what's considered complex rehab technology, whereas the other um, products are much more standard DME. Next slide. So to give you some characteristics <clears throat> of uh, basic DME manual wheelchair, the high strength lightweight um, K4, K0004 chair uh, is at the top of the line of DME basic chairs. Um, it still weighs uh, 30 to 34 pounds and um, is more difficult to propel than um, the ultra lightweight wheelchair, um, but it does have more sizes than its um, the lesser uh, grade DME wheelchairs. It has a little bit of adjustability and a few more seat sizes available. Next slide. The ultra lightweight K0005 chair um, is typically less than 30 pounds. Um, it's easiest to propel. Um, it comes in both folding and rigid frames and is fully adjustable um, in many different aspects. You can get um, different configurations uh, to help you complete your activities of daily living, to protect your shoulders, um, and to help you navigate in different environments. Um, because of the different configurations that are available and the ability to adjust the rear axle, um, it can not only provide you with better postural support and weight distribution on the chair, um, but it also makes it easier to roll and uh, easier to, to function out of. Next slide. So that adjustable axle that I was talking about is, is, um, is the key feature, one of the key features on the ultra lightweight chair. So the axle, the rear wheel axle is what we're talking about. And if you look at the picture, you can see um, this woman's fingertips are, are touching the rear axle and that's the ideal adjustment. It's not can the person reach them, but when their arms fall naturally down to their sides, do their fingertips touch the rear axle? And when you've set the chair up in that way by being able to adjust the rear axle, you make it so that 75 to 80% of that person's weight is over that rear axle. And that's really important. You want the larger rear wheels being able to carry most of the weight of the user in the chair and that's what makes the chair roll easier. If the axle is too far rearward, like it is on most of the lesser chairs, then that puts more weight on the little bitty front casters. And when those little bitty front casters are loaded with more weight, that's what makes the chair hard to roll. So by optimally configuring the wheelchair for the person, you make it easier to protect the upper extremity joints you make it easier from the amount of force that the person has to use uh, to push the chair. And also you make it so that they need less repetition. So if we can limit force, limit reps of propulsion and make the chair easier to roll, then, then we've done a good job configuring the chair. Next slide. So some of the other things that you can adjust on an ultra lightweight wheelchair include the back angle, um, you can get different types of armrests, uh, different types of leg rests and foot rests, uh, different types of wheels and tires. And the seat uh, comes in many different sizes. And in fact, uh, in this, uh, using an ultra lightweight wheelchair, you can make the wheelchair fit the person. It's not that the person has to fit the wheelchair, right? These don't fit you like a t shirt, small, medium, and large, right? They fit you exactly. Uh, to made to measure specifications. Next slide. The ability to have. Oh, I was going to say, sorry. Um, this is Bill. He's been in a wheelchair, he's a longtime wheelchair user um, 
he does not have myositis or, or uh, a type of myositis, but he is going to talk briefly in this video about the benefits of having an optimally configured wheelchair, particularly for someone who's gonna be using it for a long time. Go ahead and start the video. The ability to be able to have something fit me perfectly is really what has reduced my pain level and has really increased my activity level. It really can allow you to extend your active years in a manual chair. Uh, so I think those are really key points that, um, you know, anyone who is a stakeholder in, in using a manual chair is, is going to be interested in. Next slide. The ability to be able to have something fit me perfectly. So in order to um, think about what's next, so if, if a manual wheelchair is not going to work for you if you're a non-functional propeller it's very similar to being like a non-functional ambulator like maybe I can push the chair a little bit but uh, there's limitations that come you know prevent me from completing uh, wheelchair propulsion safely uh, or that limit my activities of daily living and my independence with that and it could be the upper extremity weakness is just too much or the strain on my joints is too much or there's other compromise um, systemically from cardiovascular limitations or pain limitations or uh, I have functionally limiting fatigue or because uh, of my diagnosis over the course of the day I get more fatigued and it's important for me to pr protect uh, my body from becoming over fatigued. So, uh, I need to um, back off from trying to propel all day, every day. Uh, and then certainly, of course, the risk of falls. Next slide. So if you're not able to propel uh, a manual wheelchair all day under your own power, then there's options to consider uh, to help you power your push in the way that, that you need it. And so power assist is the in-between option between manual wheelchairs and power wheelchairs. And it can be used differently uh, by different people depending on their needs. Uh, uh, you'll see a video here in a minute where um, this is Julie in this picture and there's uh, another gentleman in the video, Aaron. And they'll show you different ways to engage and utilize a power assist device. One is switch control and uh, there, where there's a button to push on the side of, of the chair. Uh, the button can also be mounted to the armrest or, or somewhere else. Um, another way to control power assist is through um, a wearable. And you'll see, you see in this picture, Julie has a, a watch on. Um, that's a smart watch that's attached, uh, that's um, paired uh, and connected by Bluetooth with the power assist device. In this case, it's a smart drive you see on the back of her, her chair. And so she, there's gesture-based uh, activities or actions that you do. You do a double tap to engage that smart drive motor and that gesture act, you know, via Bluetooth activates that smart drive motor and then Julie can just steer while the smart drive does the pushing. So um, when you listen to the video, I also want you to listen to Aaron and Julie say, um, how it helps them complete their activities and how it helps them stay active longer in a manual wheelchair. So if you could go to the next slide and the video will begin. My name is Aaron Baker. My name is Julie Malukas. I was injured in a motorcycle accident 20 years ago. I flipped the bike and landed on my back and the bike landed on me and I broke two bones in my back. I raced professional motocross and had a training accident. I went over the handlebars and broke my neck. Then 20 years later, I had a stroke and then another one. My reaction to potentially never being able to walk again was um, disbelief, but I knew the gravity of my situation. I mean, I literally couldn't move a muscle from below my neck, complete quadriplegic. The first wheelchair that I got just appeared in my room at rehab the day before I left. It probably weighed 50 pounds. At the time of my injury, I mean, there was a distinct difference. There was electric wheelchairs and there was manual wheelchairs. Today, though, the power assist is that sweet spot in between. I knew 
I could benefit from the smart drive the moment I saw it. That is it. That's my ticket to an adventurous life. Mounted on the back of my chair, simple instructions on how to double tap, and away I went. The smart drive is portable. It's light. I can put it on a chair myself. I can take it anywhere. The battery life is great. It's got a ton of torque. Take me across the grass. It will take me up pretty steep hills. I love using the switch control. I can push it when I want it to start and let go when I want it to stop. And it's easy, it's safe, and I'm totally in control. E2 is the future. It's really a lot like my smartphone. And it functions just like the push tracker. The double tap feature is still there. I'm a very active person. I love anything outdoors. I love to go camping, spend a few days on the lake with friends. With a smart drive, I can go all around the farmer's market, go to the grocery store, meet a friend for coffee, take my dog for a walk, go to the bookstore, and do a ton of other things when I get home. There were a lot of times that I said no to something because I didn't feel like I could. I would just say no because I knew how much of a struggle it would be just to get there. And then to be in the moment and try to stay happy and, and comfortable and confident, it wouldn't happen. I travel all over the world now with my smart drive. I've seen Europe just this year because of smart drive. Using the smart drive now instead of waiting till I can't push anymore just gives me more opportunities. I'll be younger longer and I'll be happier and out in the world doing everything I want to do. Maybe we'll ride smart drive across the country, I don't know. I want to do more, I want to conserve my energy for the things that I love most. I don't want to be tired just getting there. And that's what the smart drive allows me to do, is to just roll comfortably to my destinations and enjoy the ride along the way. You could go to the next slide. There we go. So I hope that gives you some ideas about how and where Power Assist can be used. And um, when you, I know neither Aaron nor Julie had myositis, but uh, the functional challenges can be similar, especially when you're talking about going long distances or going up steep hills uh, or conserving energy um, to, to enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, and not limit your activities. And that's one of the cues that you might notice or that you might um, report to your clinician is that I'm not going here, or I'm not going there, I'm not electing to participate in as many things because it's just too much. It's hard for me to get there. It's too much effort just to push there or to try to walk there. That's a clue that uh, if you're self-limiting that way that, that maybe you could use a mobility device that could help um, be a tool to get you there so that you can enjoy the activity. So some other cues about when to consider power assist would be um, pain, um, range of motion and strength issues, cognitive factors, fatigue, um, cardiovascular issues, shoulder problems or postural problems, um, activity limitations, uh, difficulty with completing activities during the day, um, and uh, participation, you know, whether you're limiting yourself there or environmental factors, you know, as I mentioned, such as hills or ramps or um, transportation. Sometimes it's a lot more difficult to transport a power wheelchair than a manual wheelchair uh, with a smart drive on it. So um, that's something to consider. Uh, you can put a smart drive on either a folding chair or a rigid chair. So that, if you, know, if you prefer a folding frame or a rigid frame, it doesn't matter, it can go on either one. Um, so you just have to think about what your goals are and, and work with your clinician to consider whether this is the right device from, for you. Next slide. So um, that really moves us to power mobility and when it would be time to consider power, a full power chair, next slide. Um, so the power, power mobility devices across the spectrum from basic DME um, to CRT, you know, you can see for yourself as you move from left to right that the chair becomes more complex. 
the chair on the far right is, is group five is pediatric. Um, so um, next slide. So let's talk about the seating that's available because no matter what the power wheelchair base is, you are going to have to sit on this thing. So seating is really important. Um, captain style seating um, that's available on the more basic DME level power, uh, power chairs um, are kind of a one size fits most um, and do not offer uh, support beyond, beyond the basics. Rehab seating that's available on more of the complex rehab technology power chairs is uh, again, size specific, you know, the chair will fit you, not you to the chair. Um, and you can um, get pressure leaving and positioning options in addition to what, um, in addition to the basics. So a more specific headrests, armrests, um, lateral supports, you, the ability to use different cushions and backs to give you the support that you need and also the skin and tissue protection that you need. And then perhaps most importantly, uh, power seat functions. So the complex rehab uh, technology power wheelchair is designed to handle a seat elevator and a power tilt and power recline and power legs and, and um, active reach or, or power anterior tilt to help you reach things. And that's just not available on the lesser chairs. Next slide. So uh, some of the seating uh, options that you can put on, on, a, on a power chair or a manual chair for that matter, these cushions and back supports uh, can go on either one. Um, and, and in fact, if you're sitting in a wheelchair all day long, you absolutely should have a cushion and you should have a back support because sling upholstery um, is not for everyone for, for long-term sitting. Um, so, uh, especially on the seat, um, th there are some people who prefer, uh, a, you know, a sling back if it's a, a adjustable tension upholstery, but for most folks, I would recommend a, um, a back, good back support and a, uh, and a good, and for sure, a good seat cushion. Um, so, I know one of the questions I saw in advance was, what is a Rojo cushion? A Rojo cushion is um, an air flotation cushion. Uh, you see the pictures uh, with the cover taken off. Uh, they look like the, the cushion that's on the bottom on the left side and the one in the upper left are both examples of Rojo cushions. So those are air cells and they allow you to immerse inside. Uh, you sit in a Rojo, not on it, right? Uh, most people make the mistake of over inflating them and then it's like a, a moon bounce, right? Then you feel unstable. But if you inflate it properly, which is just normal air pressure, um, then you sink into the Rojo and it's not only very comfortable, but it provides um, you with excellent skin and tissue protection and is widely recognized as a leader in the industry in, in providing skin and tissue tech protection through immersion technology. So there's different types of Rojos. Some have contours, some are more linear and flat. Um, they have come in with different size air cells and it's your clinicians and providers job to help figure out the one that's the best match for you. There's also foam cushions. Again, some are contoured like the Comfort Company cushion that you see there. Some are more flat or linear. Some use combinations of gel and air in addition to the foam. So there's, there's a whole lot of options out there and that's why I really recommend you get some assistance in determining the one that's best for you. And the same can be said for back supports. You know, some are very low like the one you see on the right. Some are higher and have some contour that wraps around. Uh, like the one that you see on, on the left. The one on the left is a Rojo uh, Agility Max Contour Back. Um, it's got nine inches of, of contour on the lateral supports. Uh, and then the one on the right is from Comfort Company. It's a lower back. So again, you have, you have options there. Next slide. Um, again, looking at the seating that's available on power, um, scooters are not designed to be used with any of these cushion or back supports. You have, again, it's kind of what you see is what you get. Um, so uh, that's an important thing to, uh, to remember. There's three-wheeled scooters and four-wheeled scooters. 
four wheel scooters take up a lot of space and in most people's houses, it's not something that will work in a house, but um, if, if you're riding around in the neighborhood, then maybe that would work for you. Um, the smaller scooters can are designed to be transported and folded up, but still are kind of pretty heavy um, when you're going to put them in the back of, of a car. Whoever's lifting it is going to have to be able to do a, a pretty, pretty decent lift. Um, it's certainly going to weigh more than an ultra lightweight wheelchair and a smart drive, and it's not going to have as good a seating on it. So something to consider there. Next slide. So after we leave scooters, uh, move on to other power wheelchair uh, options. Again, you've got group one, two, three, and four power wheelchairs uh, in this picture. So the top two on the two pictures on the top are are the group one and two chairs, and then the chairs underneath are uh, the group three and four power wheelchairs, and they're all. Uh, differentiated by the type of um, power seat functions that they can support, the type of seating options that are on there, whether they have suspension or not, um, the sophistication or the programmability of the electronics on there, meaning um, how do I make it go faster, slower, accelerate, decelerate, but also can I use a different type of input device from a standard joystick, and if so, what kind, and uh, what else can I have the chair do uh, for me that I can't do myself, including connect to Bluetooth um, and, and that type of thing. Um, the group three and four chairs will have better obstacle climbing ability uh, because they have better suspension uh, and are more stable. They will also go faster and have more durable and more powerful uh, motors and are, and are available in more sizes. Uh, next slide. So group one and two uh, captain seat type chairs are good for short term, short distances, getting from point A to point B um, and are appropriate if you have the ability to sit unsupported. Um, if you don't have any concerns about skin and tissue uh, integrity, um, if you're able to use the standard seating that's available on there and you're going to be just mostly on flat terrain and you anticipate that your condition is going to not change very much. Next slide. A group three power wheelchair has a much more robust frame. Uh, it's gonna be able to manage higher speeds, more terrains, go for a longer distance, get over little obstacles um, more easily. Um, the suspension not only uh, helps you manage that terrain, but also protects you and protects the chair. Uh, and you can get a variety of different seating uh, options on it, as well as power seat functions on it. Next slide. So an example of the power seat function, uh, this is that active reach that I mentioned, which is a, the dynamic combination between seat elevation and anterior tilt. So you can see uh, this is Cindy here. She's reaching into the cabinet. She's not just raised up vertically, but it also increases uh, her horizontal reach. And that's what's important um, because you're reaching into the closet, into the cabinet, in the kitchen, into the refrigerator, or it gets you over the sink, right? Not just to the sink, but over the sink. So even if you're in the bathroom and you need to wash your face or brush your teeth and get over the sink, you can, you can do that with the active reach, anterior tilt. Next slide. So uh, group three power wheelchair, just some more characteristics of it. I think I've touched on a lot of these. You can go on flat and uneven terrain. It's not an ATV, okay? So can't get crazy, but you should be able to get, you know, up and down curb cuts and over small curbs and thresholds and, um, certainly deal with with uh, inclines with without difficulty again not an ATV but um, will get you where you need to go for reasonable community terrain um, you can use with different types of input devices um, and can change with you so as your condition changes or progressive progresses the the joystick can be programmed differently a different joystick or input device can be added on 
um, different seating uh, can be added on or changed because it's very they're very modular. Um, okay, thank you. Next slide. And then group four power chairs are the more most robust and durable frames. They typically have a little bit larger wheelbase um, than a group three chair. And because of that stability are offer, able to offer a larger range of power seat functions, including power standing, as you see pictured here. Um, the seat elevator will go higher um, on a permobile. Um, this is an F5 VS uh, that you see in the picture. The seat elevation goes up to 14 inches, where on its group three counterpart, the F3, the seat elevator goes to 12 inches. Um, but it's the because of the stability that we offer the power standing on the group four base. Um, it's designed with a, the most robust uh, suspension system that's, and uh, most powerful motors uh, that are designed for the most active users who are really gonna um, give the chair a run for its money. Uh, next slide. So the bottom line is that each person should be evaluated by the clinician and an experienced ATP to figure out what the best fit for their physical and functional um, clinical needs are um, and uh, make sure that we get the right seating system, the right mobility base, whether it's a manual ultra lightweight manual wheelchair, you know, with or without a smart drive uh, or a power chair and with what seat functions and what seating system. And then the clinician's job can, is to do the documentation to help justify these devices to the third party payer, the insurance company. And then it's the supplier's job to then bill the insurance company. Uh, and then the supplier is also responsible for ongoing maintenance and repair needs on the chair. Uh, so it's good to have a good supplier involved that can help you on the front end, but then it can also help you with the, the follow along on that. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, oh yes, the resources. I wanted to make sure this, because this was another question. What resources um, did uh, are available out there? Uh, this is a screenshot of the user's first mobility map. It's available on the United Spinal uh, website. If you just type in into Google user's first mobility map, you'll get to United Spinal and they have a variety of questions and these questions are help to help are designed to help you think about the features that you need the mobility device to have so um, it really helps you think through how am i going to use this throughout my home what's most important to me um, and that helps you prepare um, prepare for your evaluation um, there's also RESNA, the Rehabilitation Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America, as RESNA has some great resources on it, uh, uh, including a directory of certified complex rehab technology providers. So you can look up in your area uh, on the RESNA website, where can I find uh, a RESNA certified ATP, Assistive Technology Provider. Um, the Clinician Task Force is a, is a group of experienced clinicians uh, across the country who, um, who specialize in uh, seating and wheeled mobility. Again, if you're looking for a clinician in your area, this is a place to look. And then lastly, this is the Permobile website. There's a lot of information on there about different types of complex rehab technology. There's some blogs uh, that talk about the technology and you can learn from them. There's even some education courses and, and ways to contact uh, your Permobile provider in the area uh, or representative in the area or education team member in the area so that we can help you. Next slide. Um, there's also some alternative funding resources that I wanted to put on this and I, I think uh, it looked like I saw a chat thing pop up that you were, will have access to this information as well. Um, it's on our Permobile website under um, the resources there that you can see from, from on here. But um, Permobile Foundation is uh, the nonprofit arm of our company. Um, when anybody 
gets a permobile power chair, or tie light manual chair, money goes back into the foundation. Uh, and what we use it for is to help um, wheelchair consumers have access to technology that is sometimes outside the coverage limitations of their insurance. You know, um, technology has always outpaced funding um, in, uh, in our country. And so it's important, uh, we believe it's important to uh, help people have access to technology. So if, um, if someone, for example, needs uh, a seat elevator and that anterior tilt or active reach and it's denied and they have a denial from the insurance company and they're working with a, a wheelchair provider to help them get the technology, then they can apply to the foundation for financial assistance. Um, so that's what that is. Next slide. Um, so at this point, I guess it's our question and answer time. Thank you so much um, for this incredible presentation, Ginger. We're so grateful um, to you. And as a reminder to folks, um, please uh, type questions into the chat box. Um, and we also um, have a number of questions that people did send in when they registered. Um, so we will start with some of the questions that we did receive um, during that registration period. Uh, we are uh, really, uh, we had a lot of really great questions that we did receive um, during that time as well. Um, and so just to start off, we got um, uh, quite a few questions um, and, and you mentioned quite a bit about um, some of the scooters. Um, there was a lot of questions about whether there were higher seat scooters um, and scooters that could hold rollators. Do you, do you have any um, advice on that? Um, I would, when you get to your evaluation and if, the, if you're going to pursue a scooter, I would ask the person who's selling it to you whether it can or not. Okay. Um, and, and that person is likely to also sell rollators. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've seen them attached in different ways, but I, you know, whether they have a specific good attachment, you know, uh, for a specific rollator or walker is going to vary from scooter to scooter. Um, and I couldn't begin to tell you how many different ones are out there. So I would just ask the person that you're buying it from, say, this is one of the things that's important to me. Uh, will this work? Okay, great. That's helpful. Um, we also got a number of uh, questions about uh, um, wheelchair, power wheelchairs that could be used in um, different types of terrain. Um, and also um, there's some concern about the weather, rain and other things like that. Could you speak a little bit to that? Right. So um, power wheelchair manufacturers, especially when we're talking about a group three uh, or above power wheelchair, understand that rain happens and that everybody gets caught in the rain. What uh, I used to recommend people do uh, when I was working at NRH is uh, have a um, plastic bag with you, like a plastic grocery bag or something like that, so that you can take it out of your raincoat pocket and put it over top of the joystick. That way you can still drive the chair, but the joystick is protected, right? Think about like if you wouldn't leave your cell phone out in the rain or your computer, um, you definitely don't want to leave your power wheelchair out in the rain. But if you get caught in the rain, it's going to be okay. Just try not to go through the deepest puddles, right? Um, it's not meant to be submerged. Um, so, so, uh, you know, get out of the rain, uh, and, uh, when you can, and, um, and, and dry off, you know, you're just protecting the electronics. Um, there are a number of questions about trying to understand the financing, uh, for, uh, different types of equipment, um, and how Medicare works and what it covers. And could you speak a little bit about how that works? So Medicare um, will cover a group three power wheelchair for someone who has a neurologic diagnosis um, and which, you know, myositis uh, should fit into is neurologic diagnosis, myopathy or congenital deformity, congenital skeletal deformity are the, the categories for, for Medicare. And so myositis should, should fit into that. And um, so that's one of the qualification criteria for Medicare. And then 
Medicare also requires that the person has seen a physical or occupational therapist and has seen their doctor um, and has gotten orders for that uh, wheelchair evaluation um, and that the physical therapist or occupational therapist has ruled out ambulation, ruled out manual mobility, uh, and then justified the, the power wheelchair mobility uh, as what this person needs to be able to be safe and independent with their mobility and activities of daily living. Okay, great, thank you. And um, we had some questions about um, how do you uh, get, how do you get your um, yourself transferring from your power wheelchair into uh, other other items in your home, whether that be your chair or if you need a stair lift or other things like that, how would you um, how would you use transfers are, are pretty individual, you know. Okay. Um, so different people need different types of assistance for transfers. You can definitely use the power wheelchair functions of uh, seat elevation and active reach or anterior tilt to help you, uh, sort of like a seat lift chair, it lifts you up and tilts you forward. Um, and the foot plates can go down to the floor so that it helps you sort of stand pivot off of that. Um, that's a big help for a lot of people. Some people do sliding board transfers and those same seat functions, seat elevation and, and active reach or anterior tilt can help you with the sliding board transfer. Um, but, uh, you know, other considerations beyond that, it's hard to, to talk about um, specifically, you know, we're speaking in general terms here. Yep, and going back to Medicare, we did get a couple questions about um, uh, how often can you replace the chair and do you need a prescription for DME? Can you answer that again? So you, um, Medicare considers the useful life of the chair to be at least five years. Um, so typically, unless there's a, a major change in condition, it's hard to justify a new chair. And that's why um, these chairs are meant to be, um, you know, able to be adjusted, you know, uh, to a large extent uh, so that they can last five years, even for someone with a progressive condition. Medicare um, does require a physician prescription for basic DME like a cane or a walker or a scooter. Medicare does not require that you have that full in-clinic evaluation with the PT or OT for those items, but it is best practice to make sure that, that they're the right items um, for you, uh, not just something that's provided by Ed and Earl's drugstore greeting cards and liquor store, you know. Does that make sense? You're getting a higher level of, of uh, consultation. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's helpful. Um, uh, and then, um, let's see, I'm just kind of rolling through all these. We had uh, wonderful questions from our community, a lot of, uh, a lot of different questions that were coming in. Um, also, uh, I know you spoke a little bit about the, the chairs with seat lifts, and um, there were questions about whether those seat lifts are covered through insurance. Power seat elevators on a power chair are covered by some insurances, but not by Medicare. That doesn't, and, and some insurances follow the Medicare regs. And so um, they, are, they are sometimes not a covered item. That doesn't mean that they're not important. That doesn't mean that you don't need them. It just means that you might need to seek an alternative funding source like Permobile Foundation or pay out of pocket for those uncovered portions. Um, and then there were questions about uh, for the challenges that people have if they, um, they get a chair that's too heavy for their caregiver or themselves to lift um, uh, and, and they need, and that's the chair that they have, uh, have gotten, how do they transition to a different chair? Um, it's it's a challenge. Uh, transportation is a big challenge. And so that's why I, I did want to spend that time showing that smart drive and um, ultra lightweight chair as a power alternative. You know, it's a lot easier to transport those chairs. 
um, ultra, an ultralight chair with a, with a smart drive um, and, and good seating. So if you don't need power seat functions to help you with weight shifting, then, you know, you potentially could do okay. You know, you need an evaluation, you need to try it out, but you might, your needs may be met with an ultra lightweight wheelchair or a smart drive and good seating. And then you wouldn't have to worry about having to lift a scooter or lift uh, some other type of group one or two power chair into a vehicle. Um, there are lifts uh, that you can purchase from third parties to help lift uh, chairs into the back of a vehicle, but somebody's got to be able to operate that and take the chair apart to do that. So that in itself is, is a bit of a job. Um, to transport a power chair, you know, that has power seat functions, you really need an adapted van. You know, you need to be able to drive that chair into the van. Um, in order to, to take it places um, or use, you know, tra other transportation services or public transportation. So I have two questions that popped up here, which is um, uh, with something like the smart drive, um, are there options for people who need um, a joystick? Um, is there ways for them to use something like that, which is something easier for them to operate? Mm -hmm. There are other power assist companies out there besides Smart Drive that will do um, a joystick add-on. Uh, Frank Mobility that makes the eFix uh, is a joystick-driven um, add-on option. Great. Um, and um, the other question that um, popped up on this was um, having to do with um, when you mentioned the changing of the body positions, um, what are the best types of uh, mobility equipment for people who do need um, assistance in changing body position? Yeah, so if, if you need the power seat functions to help you move, whether it's for weight shifting, for transfers, to get in position to eat, um, to get, just to be comfortable and be able to tolerate sitting in the chair throughout the day, um, then you need uh, at least a group three power wheelchair base and, and power seat functions. You know, I, I think power tilt, recline and legs, uh, having all three of those functions at a, at a minimum is really important to be able to do those things I just listed. Um, and then if, you know, if you're able to get um, power seat elevation and active reach, I think, um, again, this is my opinion, it was my fi family member, I'd find a way to get it for them because I think it's important to help you reach things and function um, uh, and in the environment that, that we are all working within uh, at home and in the community. So we had um, a question about um, th someone saying that they uh, had recent falls, they've, they've fallen, um, uh, they've, oh, they have not, they've had many falls and near falls um, using rollator, um, uh, but they would like a power wheelchair for outside use, but, um, but use a rollator in the home um, and have had challenges. Um, is that something that's typical? Um, many insurance companies, including Medicare, um, are primarily concerned with in-home mobility. And so if you are not uh, going to use the device in the home, then that's a red flag to the, the insurance company right there that they may not fund it. Um, so that said, if you're falling within the home, then it's, it's time to uh, consider some type of help with mobility because um, continued falling is never a good plan. And so, because uh, the complications of that, of course, uh, or can be, um, you know, catastrophic. So um, anytime that, that falling is involved and falling is happening, then it's time to consider a, a different mobility device. And um, can you say just a bit about the type of equipment people would need if they, if they choose to go to a full uh, power wheelchair, one of the more, more uh, not just a smart uh, assist, but a, a larger power wheelchair? What other yeah. kinds of things might they need to help them? What other types of equipment in the home? Yes, uh, in their home um, with their cars, so lifts, ramps, other things that they might need. That was one of the questions we received. Yeah, you know, I think that um, 
I'll go back to that user's first mobility questionnaire. That can really help you individually think about that. You're gonna need a way to drive it into the house. So depending on the home, that may involve a ramp. Um, it would involve uh, you know, answering the question, how am I gonna transport this? Uh, if I'm going to go somewhere in it. And so, you know, that's an adapted van or public transportation um, or transportation um, service company. Um, if you need a powered wheelchair with power seat functions, you're also likely to need some bathroom equipment uh, to help with bathing and, and so forth in, in there. Um, and so, uh, and then whether you need equipment to help you transfer is, is another uh, consideration. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, this is incredibly helpful. Uh, appreciate you taking the time and, and um, we, uh, and I'm gonna move, sorry, I'm gonna move to the next slide. <laughs> um, we will be providing, um, people had questions about whether you could get the slides and just as a reminder, the slides will be um, uh, made available. We put the recordings up on uh, our website under our library, under webinars. So you'll be able to find them there. If you're not a member of TMA, please remember to join us. And then we will have the resources that um, Ginger was really uh, very helpful to make available to us. Those resources will be uh, sent out in a survey to you all um, once you send out, once you return the survey that will also be attached in that email. Um, so thank you all very much. We hope you will provide the post event survey to us, letting us know what you um, thought of this event and, um, and join us for our future webinars. Um, when you join TMA, you can learn about future webinars and other events, including our upcoming virtual summit and our annual patient conference. And again, thank you so much, Ginger, for this very informative uh, webinar. Sure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.